Hello Life Changers, thank you so much for joining us. We have got an amazing sermon for you, so why don't you lean in, grab a notebook, grab a pen, and get ready to hear of the more that God has for us. It's a privilege to be together. I am um, just, just because this is church, we're family, just got to get things out there. I didn't wake up to bacon and eggs this morning, didn't hot chocolate, coffee in bed, I didn't. Um, and, but I did wake up to going into the TV room, my boys watching a movie, and the scene that I walked into was from a movie called, movie called The Willoughbys or something. It's like a cartoon. And it was the four kids disowning their parents and sending them off, and the kids shouting, yay, we're orphans. So that was the opening scene of Father's Day this morning. So I don't know what they got in movies these days, but um, we, we got to deal with that and bring order and peace. It's such a privilege to be here. I send lots of love from Gabs and Fee, who are in the bush somewhere. I think um, Fee's driving the car, and Gabs the live bait. He's running behind. And um, if you haven't met them, they're awesome. They're here and have the privilege of leading in this place. But I also, just am I, who, uh, I, know, I don't think you introduced Bunty this morning, Brett. Did, did they introduce you, Bunty? Come say hello, your buddy. These are family moments, and, um, and, and uh, for those who maybe we haven't had time in the room together, Bunty is the man who oversees our worship in the city, and oversees the teams, and um, facilitates so much of that. He also has a full-time gig, a full-time job. He's also a husband. He's also many things, but devotes many, many hours. But maybe just say how's it to the Century City congregation. Hello. Um, I, I, I'd always come and visit every now and then, and I remember the very first time I led worship was at, uh, it was the school before Seamount, where we had the Milneton High School, where we had to have a kick drum, and I had to play guitar with a kick drum at the same time. This is really, really weird, and it's just amazing to see the growth over the years. Really amazing to see what God's doing. Amazing. There we go. Good. Man, a few words, and there's he's singing. Then he's got lots of, then he's got lots of, I should have asked him to sing. <laughs> But it is such a privilege, and um, maybe you, you, Gabe just asked me to share some of the things I shared last week. So if you were at Century at Table View last week, we're just sharing some of the vision and some of why we're here and how we are here and, and what the plans are, what God wants to do with us as we've been preaching through the last couple of months of the series, Move Again. And I trust that you dived into the book of Exodus. I absolutely love the book of Exodus. I, I love the story. I love what God leads us and how he leads his people and keeps taking them out of slavery and out of smallness and out of the new normal that they had established themselves and had become normal. 400 years of slavery, that's the starting point of Exodus. It's not a good spot. 400 years of slavery where the normal was your kids were born into slavery, where the normal was you work just to survive, where the normal is you get less resources to make more and to serve a master who will never show you gratitude and there will never be a different future outside of the God, Yahweh, stepping in. Even as we sang that name this morning, I want to remind you, we sing that word loosely because we don't really know what it means, but he reigns. He reigns. It means he's seated on his throne. He's not easily shaken. And I love that we use that word quite liberally in our world. Last year, maybe someone would have told you that Lewis Hamilton reigns in Formula One. They would use language like that. And, and yet we don't understand what it means when a king reigns sovereignly over his kingdom. And I even hear Christians sometimes saying, well, you know, we're on this side of Jesus coming again. So the reality is we're still in the rule and reign of the enemy. And I'm going, uh, no, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says when I come under the blood of Jesus, I get his rule, reign, and authority upon my life. And yes, although in this world, the enemy has his way in this world, he's causing chaos. My life doesn't have to be under the rule and reign of the enemy. My life is submitted under the authority and the perfection and the power of the blood that never fails. And when I position myself there, I stand in strength. And economies will go up and down. And politics will go up and down. And, and challenges will come and go in this life. And we'll, we'll do funerals and we'll celebrate weddings all in the same week. And we'll do it over and over again. And sometimes our heart won't know what to do with it all. But I position myself under the rule of reign of Jesus and I'm okay. And you will be too. You'll be too. If you position yourself ongoingly. Why do we come to the Word? Why do we gather in prayer? Why do we gather in moments to trust God? We are positioning ourselves as a people who say, we declare that we are positioned under the rule and reign of the Almighty God. And although I am easily shaken and stirred, He is not. He's not. Economies will go up and down. I, I, I have friends who placed a lot of trust in cryptocurrencies and they've gone down this week. It'll go up. It'll go up. It's going... <laughs> 
pray for Scott. But, um, <laughs> but, but it shakes people to their core. But we've got to be reminded of the eternal story. And you know what? This hasn't just been another week. We, we actually said goodbye to a beautiful young man this week. To the son of a beautiful lady. A young man who, when I didn't know what I was doing, and they let me lead a church in Cape Town. And sometimes I'd come to the preach and I didn't know that people wanted to hear what I had to say. Young man worshipped with passion and vigor. And his passion and vigor gave me courage to stand up confidently and preach. And I'll never forget Ben Falcher's worship. I'll never forget. I'm grateful to God for Ben Falcher. I'm grateful for that worship. And I'm grateful that God puts us in communities. That when we navigate the lows, and they're going to be lows, and we celebrate the highs because I trust there'll be highs. My anchor and my rock is not my ability to navigate the lows or celebrate the highs. My anchor is Jesus. It's my anchor. To be honest, part of me in worship this morning just wanted to worship more. As we stand in this place, just to, just to worship more, just to sing that name, Jesus, 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 Jesus. Yesterday we were driving with our family and we drove past a place that was very profound for our family last year. And I, I've never called on the name Jesus more. Because I know that outside of that name, there is no anchor that's unshaken. Outside of that name, there is no power that is unmoved by this word. Outside of that name, there is no strength that cannot be exposed outside of that name. And so as we gather, we gather here because God has been moving us as a people and a church. Maybe you don't know the story and, and the history of why and how we are here. It's like, oh, cool, the church moved. Uh, to be honest, I drove to Sable Square this morning. <laughs> and I should know we are here, kind of being a part of it. It's like I realize, but sometimes you realize you just, you just move forward. Oh, God's just doing another thing. No, God's just not doing another thing. God is moving his people, and God is speaking, and God is calling. And you are here because God spoke to people, and I'm here because God spoke to people, and they bought a field in Tableview, 70 people. And, and we do speak about the Georges, but I, I arrived this morning. There's Henry behind the coffee machine, I think. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. But a, but a group of 70 people bought a field, a literal field, on the end of what was then known as Tableview, and there was nothing more. On sand and dust. And that field has served and loved. And they built a building on that field. And they've served a community and reached out and preached the gospel and seen the kingdom of God come. Why? Because the mission and the mandate is from a king who's not moved easily. By economics, by challenges, by... All the things that we'll face in this life. And he calls us to a simple manner, uh, rhythm. He calls us to a simple life of keeping moving forward. And I love, as we've been preaching, move again. And I realize we didn't put it on the wall. I can generally just point to the wall in this church. We've got reach far and raise up on the wall. It's on the wall. Now, move again. I've loved you. And I want to challenge even fathers this morning. I've realized I can be an average dad. I, I can. And I am Sometimes. But God hasn't called me to be an average dad. I'm okay to be average other things. I'm okay to be an average golfer as long as I still beat breath. Then that's fine. I'm okay to be a, an average actually almost anything. I don't want to be an average husband. I don't want to be an average dad. So I need to take on the grace of God to not be. Because average becomes something we accept quick and easy. And so move again challenges me that the 400 years that become the new normal, God pulls us into a new story. He's doing something with us. He's doing something with us today. He's, as, he, as we move location, this is not about a better building for church. Oh, more comfortable, higher ceiling. Um, look at that better space in the coffee shop. If that's all this move is about, I'm telling you, we are missing it. The only reason we are here is because we are people on mission. We are a missional people. The only reason we are here is because the people who aren't here today, that's why we're here. Honestly, as, as a man came and said, hey, we've got this building in Century City and, and you can rent it, I, my initial response was, hmm, it's a stretch. I don't know if I feel like a stretch right now. The last two, three years have felt like a stretch. Uh, who's felt stretched in the last two, three years? It's just like you've stretched in every area. The work and you thought, oh, we'll work from home. And that's like, okay, next minute you're working more. And then you realize that, oh, maybe they'll, they'll diminish the targets just a little bit. You know, it's been tough. Ha <laughs> ha, no, double digits. 
And you realize this world is about stretching. And yet sometimes we come and we come to the kingdom story and we go, oh God, I'm not sure I want to be stretched. But God started to speak. He started to speak a word of buying a field in, a, in an area where we can reach a city into different demo- demographics. You know why we're here? And why we've moved here is because we can reach into areas where there's wealth and areas where there's poverty. We can reach, and they're not far. And, and when, when we say to someone in Cape Town, hey, you know what, why don't you come to church? Oh, where is it? In Century City. Because people are doff. Can we say that at church? Everyone thinks, I'm from Durban, so whenever someone says to me, meet me in Century City, it sounds halfway. Like, that's cool. It's like, shame. Someone the other day, I didn't realize they live in Fishhook. I said, hey, we'll meet halfway in Century City. They're like, cool. I won. <laughs> And it's that, and because we want to reach a city. And the reason we're here is because God, five, six years ago, clarified us for us what our mission is. It's to reach those who are far from Christ. And I want to remind you that in position, you maybe say, well, that's not my job. I'm telling you, there's a mandate on our lives to be a people who are reaching those who are far from Christ. You know what? Which means we make some decisions differently. Which means we make some phone calls. We, we get on the phone, and I've got a friend who's struggling in Durban, so, and he's moving to the UK, so I'm phoning my other friend in the UK. I said, hey, I'm sending you a mission. He says, that doesn't sound good. I said, it's going to demand some things. And my mate's quite intense, and he's in a tough spot in life, but he needs a friend, and you're going to be his friend. But that guy's got Jesus. So that guy goes, okay, how can I help him? I said, cool, he needs help. That's the mission. Because the reaching far isn't just something the church gets to do on, public, on big kind of weekends of church and Christmas and Easter. No, reaching far is who we are. If you want to know who this church is, I'm telling you, we're a church where our hearts are ripped open wide with the burden to see the mission of God come in our head. So when I call people to say, we want to be a people who are going to sow and we're going to buy, actually there's a burden on me going, yes, God, I know these are tough economic times and I'm very aware that people are under pressure and I'm very aware some people have taken hits, but I live with another burden, another burden that God has called us to fulfill the mandate of God in our lives, in our generation. It's a burden. It's a burden that as believers, we should carry. You see, we get the grace for it. We get the the life for it. We get the power for it. But there's a burden to say, actually, my world, my city, will they come to know Jesus? These young guys are going on a mission trip next week to Mozambique to preach the gospel. Because there's a burden inside them to take the gospel to those who don't know. Can I dare say even publicly, bless them. We, we, as a church, we're going to, but bless them. Bless them financially. They need to take Bibles to Mozambique in certain languages. Bless them. Why? Because there's a burden inside of us to take the kingdom of God to the ends of the earth. I've really got to get to my notes because I'm not on my notes. <laughs> but I, I just want to pour myself out this one. I want to remind us what we're on about. This is more than a building. It's more than a building. See, because I think in that back left corner, God's going to encounter people who are reluctant to come to church, so they walked into the far side and try to hide out away from people. But God's going to encounter them so powerfully and restore lives and dignities and purpose. Amen. And I think God's going to bring people who, who are looking for a lifeline. They're looking for a home. They're looking for a safe house. God's going to bring them here. This is not about a building. This is a field to be worked for the kingdom of God. Like everything is actually in our lives, I would say. It's, it's a well of fresh water in a dry world. It's a place where someone would come and, 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 and get their first hug in years. Safe hug. Where they would feel loved and authentic care. That's why we're here. And we say it often and, and we remind ourselves that I, I am not into entertaining the church. I'm sorry. I, I, I can't. I can't do that for the rest of my life. I was a worship leader for years, and I, could lead, I can lead worship for an hour and a half, no problem. And Bunty could easily. And I could do things, but I realized there wasn't, when we'd get to the end of the meeting at times, you know what question we never asked is, did someone encounter God for the first time? Now, I love the fact of believers encountering God again and again in church, in moments, and I think that's spectacular. But there's got to be another question as well. Did someone encounter that grace for the very first time? Because then we're starting to reach far. Not just through our lives on Sunday to, or Monday to Friday, but in every space of our life. And then we call to raise people up in Christ. And some people are going to come and then they're not going to know what to do. But someone laid out a chair and served and, and someone made them a coffee out there. And their hearts open up just a little bit to say, actually, would you take this hand to step up into more? That's what this building is. We're buying a field. 
where people who literally are going into that field to die will find life and be raised from the dead on this side of eternity so that into eternity they can run to the arms of their king. I'm not trying to just inspire you. I'm trying to give you perspective. Because I'm telling you, as the church, we often get pulled back into that space of our slavery, our smallness, and too much of the church still think we're in lockdown. Still think we, we're in a state of lockdown, some state of control in our lives. And, and God says, no, it doesn't matter what governments do. I set you free so that others can encounter that freedom, so that others can encounter that life. I've set you free. I've set you free. So I'm, our burden becomes one of we're going to reach far, we're going to rise up, and then we're going to release people wide for the kingdom of God. And we're going to send them out full of power. We've got a, young, a couple with young kids moving overseas soon. I'm going, God bless them. And wherever they go, I pray their fire in you would become more and more. But I want to jump into because part of the by that field comes from an incredible scripture in Jeremiah 32. And I just want to take us through a few points there and help us understand that actually it, the call of God doesn't always come at a convenient time. You know that? It's like, God, I'm not ready yet. Just if I could just get this. Well, a call came to a man named Jeremiah who is this reluctant prophet in his 20s. He's like, I want to go live life. God says, no, you're going to become a prophet, but not just any prophet. You're going to become a prophet in a time where my people are rebelling. And they're on a journey towards chaos. And I'm calling you to be a prophet. And basically, you're my prophetic hitman because God didn't speak to his people in those days the way he does now. There was no spirit of God that had been poured out. No, God would use his prophets to speak his word to his people. So prophets were those who received the word of God and delivered it. And this is where we get our word by that field from. It comes from this. It sounds like this Jerusalem is under siege. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the 10th year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, which was the 18th year of Nebuchadnezzar. For then the king of Babylon, Babylon's army besieged Jerusalem, and Jerusalem the prophet was shut up in the courts of the prison, which was in the king of Judah's house. Let me just explain what's going on. God comes to this man and says, I'm telling you to buy a field. He's in Jerusalem, which is besieged by the Babylonians. His enemy are all around, and he's in jail. Within the courts, he's probably some commentators who are in stockades in an area where his friends could come and visit him. And God speaks to him in his chains, in his burden, in his challenge. I want you to buy a field in a war zone. It's like your cousin coming to you and saying, I need you to buy this from me. It's the best deal in the world. It's a penthouse in Ukraine right now. Like you're going, ah. And he shows you the pictures of taps and the awesome freestanding bath. And like the water comes from the ceiling. You lie in the bath and like massage. It's unbelievable. No, that's the kind of deal that's going on here. And but I want to start, it starts like this. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. I want to encourage you to be someone who seeks the word of the Lord. We, 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 we quickly swayed by the word on the street. We quickly swayed by the word on Twitter or Instagram or YouTube. We quickly swayed by the word of critics or, or commentators. And yet the Bible calls us to be men and women who are swayed, who are led, who are driven by the word of the Lord. First and foremost, his word that is given to us, that leads us in every area of life. I would challenge you and say, well, the Bible doesn't speak into this challenge I'm facing. I'm telling you there's not a situation on this earth the Bible doesn't speak into. Not one. And then also, the word that he speaks. The word. And I want to encourage even fathers this morning. Maybe that is the emphasis. Fathers, take a hold of the word of God for your season, for your life. And maybe saying, well, Mark, I've never heard the word of God. Well, I'm asking you to take a chance. I'm asking you to quieten other voices. Because I'm, I'm sitting with men and women all the time as I seem to be in an age called midlife. I'm in that. I seem to be in that age. Which means there seems to be a whole bunch of things happening, but one of them is called a midlife crisis that is happening in some of my friendship circles. And I get the phone call and I'm going, wow. Now I need to find the word of God that anchors me and holds me. And Jeremiah, you know, this amazing book I searched, the, that statement, the word of the Lord, is mentioned 62 times in just that one book. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah 62 times. 
This man knew how to hear the word of God. And the challenge is the enemy is around him. He's sitting in stockades. It doesn't make sense. And he's in a prison. It carries on in verse 3. For Zedekiah, king of Judah, had shut him up, saying, Why do you prophesy and say, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will give this city into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall take it. And Zedekiah, king of Judah, shall not escape from the hand of the Chaldeans, but shall surely be delivered into the hand of the king of Babylon, and shall speak with him face to face, and see him eye to eye. Then he shall lead Zedekiah to Babylon, and there he shall, he shall be until I visit him, says the Lord. Though you fight with the Chaldeans, you will not succeed. So what's happened here? God speaks to Jeremiah, says, here's what I want you to do. Go to the king of Jerusalem, go to the king and say, here's the thing, you're going to fight against the Chaldeans who have besieged you and the Babylonians, and you're going to lose. And you're going to be taken prisoner. Thus says the Lord. Who's received a prophecy like that recently? It's like, that's the one I want. And my enemy is going to look me eye to eye, face to face. I'm going to be taken. Now, that's what's happening here. And he says, you will not succeed. And the challenge is, this Zedekiah character had witnessed God move and spoken through Jeremiah so many times. But he's struggling with his unbelief. So irrationality kicks in. He sticks the prophet in chains. Even though God had used Jeremiah so many times in his story. And in that situation, in that context, this is what the Lord says. And Jeremiah said, the word of the Lord came to me saying, behold, Hanamel, the son of Shalom, your uncle will come to you, saying, buy my field, which is in Anathoth, for the right of redemption is yours to buy it. Then Hanamel, my uncle's son, came to me in the court of the prison, according to the word of the Lord, according to the word, and said to me, here's what happens. He's in stocks. God says, your cousin's going to come to you. He's going to make you a deal, a deal that makes no sense. And that's exactly what happens. Why? Because it's according to the word of the Lord. And while he's in stocks, his cousin comes to him and says, hey, my cousin. You know that guy? Anyone who starts a sentence with my cousin? He's, but this is his cousin. I'm from Durban. Cousin means many things. And, and he says, my cousin, I've got the deal of the century for you. And he visits his cousin in jail thinking his internet's not working so hot on the internet. So he doesn't actually know the enemy's all around. So maybe he's the one relative in the world who will buy that field. You've got to understand, Anathoth is three kilometers outside of Jerusalem in the middle of the area besieged by the Babylonians. I'm trying to make you realize how bad this deal was. It's the worst deal in the world. It makes no sense at all. And so it carries on, and, and they challenge us as they navigate this thing. It's, even though it's totally worthless, his cousin comes and brings it. But Jeremiah responds, and this is the lesson from the prison deal. He says, God will restore why can Jeremiah hold on to the promise of the word? Not because it makes sense. Because of this. Then I charge Baruch before them. So he's in stocks. Baruch comes to visit him. He says, this is what I want you to do. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. Take these deeds. It's the first title deed sale ever recorded in the Bible, Jeremiah 32. Both this purchase deed, which is sealed, and this deed, which is open, and put them in an earthen vessel that they may last many days. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, houses and fields and vineyards shall be possessed again in this land. So what is he saying? He's saying there's destruction coming. You're going to lose everything in this land. But the God of heaven, who's above the everything of this earth, is going to restore in this land. And houses and fields, they'll be restored in this land. And I trust God so much that this is what I'm calling you to do. Take that title deed. And put it in something that cannot be destroyed by fire, that men and women can't get to. So that when the God of heaven who restores after the chaos, however long it takes, will find that title deed and will flourish in this land. You want to know what faith looks like? Faith looks like obeying the word of God as the enemy's on the doorstep. It's easy to obey God at the top of a mountain when things are good. And some is here. It's easy to obey God. It's another thing to obey God when the future looks bleak. It's another thing to obey God and to his word, to trust him in every area of our lives when the enemy's at the door. And the thing that's being offered to us looks like the worst deal in the word. It says, but then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Verse 27, behold, I am the Lord. The God of all flesh is anything too difficult for me. I honestly believe every believer will get to somewhere in their life where God is going to ask them that. Is anything too difficult? Oh God, you don't know my marriage. You don't know my relationships. You don't know my father. 
And every Father's Day comes around, you're going, Mark, you didn't have my father. I didn't have your father. I didn't. But we've got the same father. When we come to that father, God's got to speak. And because of the freedom and the forgiveness and the, that we've received, we have to start to pour out. You know who's it's hardest to pour out to? Is those closest to us who've disappointed us the most. Now, Father's Day is a reminder that my job, my only job, that the Bible mandates to me is honor my father and mother. Exodus tells us, honor your father and you will live long in the land the Lord God is giving you. You know what it doesn't say? If they were perfect. If they lest you have trust fund. If they paid for your studies. If it says nothing of that. It just says honor. So the Bible challenges us and that's the word of the Lord. You want to know what the word of the Lord is to you and your parents' relationship? Honor. That's the word of the Lord. You can pray about it all you want, but I'm telling you, it's written in black and white. And it says this, and he starts to connect the promise of the chaos and the promise of this land to the purchase of the land. It says this, For thus says the Lord, Just as I brought all this great calamity on this people, so I will bring on them all the good that, is, that I've promised them. And fields will be brought in this land of which you say, It is desolate, without man or beast. It has been given into the hands of the Chaldean. Men will buy fields for money, sign deeds and seal them, and take witnesses in the land of Benjamin, in the land of Jer around Jerusalem, in the cities of Judah, in the cities of Mount, in the mountains, in the cities in the lowland, and in the cities of the south. For I will cause their captives to return. Now we buying a, why are we buying a field? Because we want to see the captives return. Yeah. We're not trying to fill this place up. It's not some strategic wisdom. And, 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 and I wish, I've heard preachers stand up and say, I stood on the mountain and God showed me lights. I've not stood on the mountain and been shown lights. I've just stood before the Almighty He says, go and reach the world. The way I do that, by planting churches in cities. And, and I love the fact that there's a diversity of churches. And I love the fact that, that God places different. And I love the fact that Bunty gets up and it's Yahweh and Jason's coming with the vibe there on the piano. Like, little, I saw Jason doing a wiggle. You've got to watch him. I saw him. He doesn't do it often, but you, when he does it, you've got to see it. But I, but I love that God puts us in community and I boast about what he's doing in this community. Why? Because I with confidence know he can send the captives here and they'll come to life. And so we continue to move forward. We continue to take a hold. And one other man challenged us. Two scriptures as we finish this morning. Matthew 13. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy went and sold all that he had. Say all. All is a lot, eh? <laughs> it's like a lot. It's like everything. He sold all that he had and bought that field. And basically, there's one main thing from this parable. It just says this. The kingdom of God is so valuable that losing everything on earth, everything on earth, but getting the kingdom is a good deal. Yeah. Buying a field in the middle of a war zone, and I'm not trying to make an analogy that we're in a war zone and South Africa's situation is, I'm not making that analogy. I'm telling you, God spoke to Jeremiah in a war zone, said, buy that field. Why? Because the captives will return. And I'm telling you, God has spoken to us, said, buy that field, and we will buy this field. And, and, and the invitation goes out to our community. The invitation goes out to our friends and to our partners. And I even sat with my business friends in Durban, who I've known for 25 years, and we've done life together. We had a, a dinner the other night. It was casual laughing, and I'm telling him about the building. I said, cool, you're going to buy that field. He's like, what do you mean? And I said, in Cape Town, we're buying a property. you my mate. We've done life together. Actually, I've spoken at your, all of your weddings. <laughs> you're going to help us buy a field. <laughs> Not because they owe me anything, but because the Spirit of God has done so much in their lives, because of the evidence of grace, and together we're going to take captives and see them set free. Yeah. And we'll ask the same question of ourselves and lead that and continue to pioneer that. And I just want to share, maybe if Jay, you want to come up. I want to tell you how we're doing it, because to be honest, I don't know how to do this stuff. I've been in two churches my whole life. In the first church, no one ever really spoke about money, like ever. These awkward buckets would come around. It was that awkward time in worship, but the flags were still going, so it kept it kind of casual. Who remembers church with flags? Some of you are like, bring it back. No, sorry. <laughs> There's one person who has a bigger version than me. It's called Gabriel Phillips. <laughs> I think he's been hit by one in his earlier years in life. I think someone was worshiping. I get sidetracked. But I've been at this church for eight and a half years. We've only done two series on finances. 
And actually, in the midst of this process of navigating, I see how much God speaks in finances. I realize as a pastor of this community, we actually haven't spoken enough to see the peace and order that God wants. And one of my greatest prayers as we enter this faith season for us as a community is that God would set people free from debt. God would bring order where there's chaos. God would bring peace where no one knows that there's absolute carnage going on. God would provide jobs to those who haven't seen jobs in a year, two years, in the midst of our community. Supernatural provision. Abundant provision. In scenarios where people say, it's impossible, God will say, is there anything too difficult for me? We're going to see that these times. As we take a hold of God. Maybe you're just visiting. Maybe it's your first time you say, let's hear about this church. No, we're going on a mission to reach and to call the captives home. And we're going to be a part of that journey. In the book of Exodus, God calls him to build a tabernacle and, and Moses has to stop the people from giving because there's such a response. And here's why. It's not because the economy in the desert was so good. There was no economy in the desert. There was just God providing and the things they took in. And they took the things they took in that they had so little of that they could carry. They brought it to build the altar. Why? Because they so believed in the redemptive power of the Almighty God. So I do call us and to carry this burden at this time. We're going to do it once a month, and it was explained in the video. The, the envelopes that we've done for years will be back and available. And within that, it's not a pledge. No one's going to phone you. No one's, Gabriel's not going to pitch up at your door and say, hey, you wrote a faith statement. No, it's just a faith statement for your heart and mine. It's a faith statement that I've got to take before God. So mine's in my Bible right now. And next week, we're going to have the first thing. We're just going to trust God and start taking up a once a month offering for the next six months. And part of that is just a providing because we're trusting God as we navigate and we buy this field. And, and maybe we explained it, maybe we didn't do it well, but we have rented this facility, we've signed a lease, but the owner has been unbelievably gracious and we've seen miracle after miracle. We really shouldn't be in this position, but we are, of having the privilege of purchasing this property. But there's a gap. And for phase one of raising that, we're looking to raise six million in the next six months. And maybe that sounds a lot, and maybe to you that sounds a little, but I'm telling you, God's going to do it. And, 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 and He's going to do it, and we're going to see miracles along the way. He's going to do it, and He's going to set young people free from a heart ruled and reigned by treasures of this earth and pull them into a different economy. He's going to do it, and He's going to see people trust in faith. And, and please do not give if you cannot find joy. Please, please don't. Please don't give if you cannot find courage. Please don't give if you cannot find the, the expectation of the kingdom of God advancing in and through. Please do not. And I'm not being facetious at all. I'm being very sincere. We'll never take up an offering after speaking about finances. That's why there'll be no offering now. We'll never manipulate a single individual to give a single cent for the kingdom of God. We never have and we never will. But I know God spoke a word. We've prayed about it for months. We've processed. We've fit, that God has spoken to us to plant ourselves. We moved here six years ago, but God always knew what he was doing. And he prepared a place for us. And we moved in in five days. If you haven't thanked the staff team and the volunteers who got stuck in from, from this location, some who came from, please do, because there was a lot of work that went in. But God's calling us to buy that field. Will you stand with me this morning? I know I've gone all over the place this morning. I just want to share one last story. There's a multitude following Jesus. It says 5,000, and they were counting just the men, so it's more. And then Jesus says to his disciples, who'd seen miracle upon miracle, they were men and should have been men of faith. He says, guys, let's feed these people. And they come and say, well, we've got nothing. What are we going to feed them? And then Simon Peter comes to him, Andrew, not Simon Peter, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother comes to him and says, hey, hey I've, there's a little guy here. He, he, he's got two fish and five small barley loaves. I don't think that was the only food in the crowd. Let's be honest, 5,000 people, you're telling me no one brought anything? You're telling me no one had a snacker in the back pocket? No one had a, a little gluten-free sandwich stashed away like my wife normally does in her bag somewhere. Even if it's from yesterday, it's fine. It's still good. You're telling me no one in that whole multitude had anything. No, but a little guy saw Jesus. A little guy saw the potential of Jesus. A little guy brought his two fish and five barley loaves. And he said, I got this. Jesus takes a little guy's 
two fish and five barley loaves. And he multiplies it to feed a multitude to which there is much left over and handed out and given away. I want to buy into that. So I want to be like David and I, I, I want to be his courage and his leader. I want to be like Mary who stayed at the, at, the cave, at, at the tomb where Jesus was. I want to be like those characters. But you know who I want to be like in the Bible? I want to be like a little guy. I just want to be a little guy with faith in Jesus. Faith that won't make sense to many. Faith that'll look crazy to many. And we're going we're gonna to look crazy. It didn't take long. Within 24 hours, I'm really, of the video going up on social media, I already got sent a video about prosperity preachers and asking people for money. It won't take long. I'm okay to look a little crazy. Because if one person gets saved, just one, I'm telling you, I'll give it all so that one would get saved. So what if that one is your family? What if that one is your and you're holding on to your barley loaf that'll go off anyway. And your fish that'll be stinky by tomorrow anyway. Or you can trust God. Again, we're not taking him an offering today. I'm trying to show you something of what Jesus is calling us to. Can we close our eyes just for a second? God, I pray for freedom in this place. I pray my passion would not be the thing that stands out. I pray, as it prayed in that beautiful book of Ephesians, Lord, that men and women would see the glorious Father. They would grow in wisdom and revelation. That whatever the circumstance, maybe it's a circumstance like Jeremiah, and they're feeling in chains, and they're going, Mark, I love the vision, I love it, but I can't partner because I'm in chaos. Well, I'm calling you now to surrender yourself and to submit to the King of Kings. Maybe this process is you coming out of chaos into freedom. Tell someone. Tell someone you need help. Get help. Draw close to community. Draw close to His Word. Start trusting God. Start trusting Him with, 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 with commitment. Start trusting Him with faith. It's got to look like something. For a little guy who we don't even know his name, he, it was bread and, and fish. God's moving us on, church. I stood up last week and I spoke to Tableview community and congregation who will not benefit directly on a Sunday from anything that happens here. I said, I'm telling you, God's calling us to buy a field so that we keep moving forward, so that my heart keeps staying free, so that black, white, rich, poor, broken, whole, restored, completely messed up, whatever life God sets in, we would be ready to receive them. That that statement we made all those years ago, that a church without the broken is a broken church. God would keep breaking our hearts for what breaks is. So the mission of God is the thing that keeps us alive. Not the next promotion possibility. Not the next Netflix, Netflix series. Something more eternal. Something more powerful. Something more glorious. Jesus. That little guy with his fish and his bread. I think he didn't see 5,000. I think he didn't see the impossibility of the situation. He just saw Jesus. I need my heart to keep seeing Jesus. And so do you. If you hear this morning you're saying, actually, Mark, I just want to see Jesus. I need to see Jesus. This is not a, just a first-time altar call. This is for those who maybe walk with the Lord a long time and say, Mark, I don't know if I'm seeing Jesus. I'm seeing the crowd. I'm seeing the need. I'm seeing the pain. I'm hearing the voices. I don't know if I can see Jesus clearly. I want to pray for the Spirit of God to show you Jesus this morning. Not an altar call for believers. We can get stuck in the crowd sometimes. If that's you this morning, will you raise your hands? I want to pray with you this morning. So I just want to see Jesus. There's a few hands. I think there are more. A few here this morning say, I need to see Jesus more. Thank you, God. Thank you, Spirit of God. We honor you in this place. Show us Jesus. 
for every hand raised. I pray for divine encounters with the living God who calls us to so much and pours in way more than we could ever understand. I pray for encounters with the living God. For some in the middle of the night, for some in the middle of the day, for some as they walk the streets of the city, for others as they do the thing you've graced them and called them to do. For some as they face the challenges of their current situation, for some as they navigate the freedom of the space you put them, I pray, let your people see Jesus. Let the challenges have come. Mr. Bresler, you're an amazing man. You're an incredible man. I pray God's grace upon you. I have the privilege of going to a school where your wife sits at the front desk. It's actually like a highlight for me. Never get greeted like that anywhere, definitely. But I pray God's grace upon you. Will you lift your hands to him right now? Okay. Lord, I thank you for this man. He's preached your word in the prisons. Week after week. He's displayed your love to a broken city. He's led people through tough economic times. He's trusted you for financial resource. I pray, God, pour out your grace from this family. Pour out your abundance from this family. Let them be a sign and a wonder of God who reigns above economics, politics, challenges, and trials. Let them tell stories and stories and stories and stories of the God who reigns, pours out his grace. We worship you, Jesus. That was an amazing sermon. If you would like to find out what your next step is, why don't you go to our website, lifechanges.org.za or follow us on social media to find out about what is happening in the life of our church. Life Changes Church, we love you. Have an amazing, amazing week.